Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first live stream on this channel. I hope you all found it all right. Um, I did feature, I put it as a feature channel on my other channel. Um, but yeah, hopefully you found it okay. Uh, I had to send the link to Claire as well. So I'm, I'm hoping I will get on Google Plus or Twitch or something, whatever it is that the young people do. I'll do something like that. I'll set up during the week. And um, today we are starting um, a Feast for Crows. And a lot of people, when they do this reread, they do a feast dance reread, right? They kind of, they they do the, the, the two books in tandem so they can do them chronologically. Yeah. You could do that. But yeah. I think it does stand on its own as its own little kind of featurette within the series. I love this book. I do. Yeah. I think, I mean, I just made a few at the beginning of mine. I've done a very kind of, so here's my Feast for Crows notebook with all my little tabs and everything in here. Most of the stationery I've got from House Polished. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so the notes that I've made are... I think I watched one of your videos where you described feast as being a bit of a marmite uh, or vegemite. You know that kind of you you either really like it or you really hate it. And I think it's I think what, there's some real big reasons for that. The big one is I feel as though the main character that's got us up to this point in the series in terms of storytelling and holding things together. Is probably Tyrion. I think for most readers, reading the books, especially the first time, would kind of latch on to Tyrion being the what what one the of the main, Tyrion. yeah, the kind of the, the you know the the linchpin, if you like, of the story progression. With He's, with John yeah. and Danny being our protagonists, <clears throat> kind of. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And we don't have any. To, we've got lots of reference already to Tyrion, but we don't have any. Tyrion chapters, and I think that jars quite a lot of people who've got to this point. Um, I also think that there's two massive new locations in the in in the sort of world at this point, um, which is the Ironborn and Dawn. Uh, a little bit, I suppose, like season five in the TV show, where those new locations, but in the books. Because I, I actually had to go back and think, oh God, I really there were real there were real aspects of the TV show for me that I disliked, and the majority of how the Ironborn were portrayed, and also as particularly Dawn and the Sand Snakes, which I just thought was just that was the weakest part for me in the TV show. It actually made me think, am I going to go back and read Feast and think, is that going to spoil it for me? But it's not. It's just that the, the, these five chapters really set up. Yeah. Because, OK, this is going to be an interesting location. Yeah. yeah because yeah. even visually, they feel different than mm -hmm. the way it was set up, even though the Iron Islands is kind of Ireland and they do represent some or they yeah. do use lots of Irish settings in the show. It's still to me, it just feels so much it's so much different like in the king's moves when i when we get to it it'll, it'll it's just total fantasy yeah. Yeah. and um i should by the way say this is claire gray in case nobody knows who you yeah. are but hi. i don't doubt that much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, before we move on i want to say hi to connie and johnny who are here first you match connie johnny i need to make up a rhyme for you guys ion sunny thank you so much guys for following us to hear i hope you all enjoyed our little uh, respite between the books i do totally agree with you the fact that it's very iron islands heavy and dorn heavy is a problem for people not for me and mm. um, i think another problem is going coming from storm where you're finally familiar with everything things feel like an old boot and all you really need to worry about are the nuances and of theories and characters and foreshadowing. And then you're launched into the first, what, three or four chapters here where you're like brand new characters, brand new settings, mm -hmm. not just brand new main characters, secondary characters, third characters. It just, it's like, what are you doing? This is like we're in a new series altogether. It's like a new, we've entered a whole new world. Um, yes. There's a different feel as well. I feel to the to the writing style. Just the first five chapters made me think, yeah, it's just 
do you get more of that visceral feeling of the sense of you know what's happening with the small folk and the impact of the wars and you see in things on a really small scale through Brienne's eyes and I think again the characters that are holding this book together for me there are three main characters Brienne, Sam and Cersei we get to get yes. into Cersei's head for the first time um, and again for me those each of those three characters are fascinating um, on their own but I also understand why they may not be <clears throat> you know everybody's favorite character where it's hard no yeah. I have to read another Brienne chapter whereas for me they were like the mainstay of the book yeah and chapter I know chapters that people really don't like but hopefully that's changed because yeah. yes uh, but for me Aaron's chapters I love Aaron chapters I know people come to them and go oh god we've to yeah. go with this one we're just not and he is <laughs> and he's really unpleasant but I think people I have finally got a payoff, especially if you've read the Winds of Winter chapter. Like it's the mm -hmm. Forsaken chapter, just like hopefully yeah. that's what people read because I've always enjoyed the Iron Island stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'd I'd be interested to know what you guys think in the chat of Feast, um, and particularly as we move into the prologue. For me, well, for next week we're reading from San Sam Juan to Brienne too, um, but for me this kind of series of chapters this week they kind of bring in the three main elements of feast for me which are like that kind of the the tension between the hopeless and the dreamless and mm. those who are ambitious and um maybe highborn in a sense but have a right to ambition where those that don't have a right to ambition i guess is the best way to put it and um, the role of women becomes way more important i feel yeah. from here yeah. before this it was kind of like people, <clears throat> women kind of circling what the men did but mm. Brienne and Cersei throw that up completely yeah. and, and Arya um, and then yeah. eventually Sansa as well and the big one which we see throughout these chapters especially the role of religion and cults in Westeros yes. and the influence that they're going to have so yeah. it really like he really does a great job even in just the prologue of introducing those ideas just with mm -hmm. Rosie with um pate and then with um the maesters talking about relore all that kind of thing and mm -hmm. magic and yeah so i guess uh let's uh jump straight into uh the prologue which is pate mm -hmm. and i feel like it's funny that you say this has a different feel for me i think this is the closest i've read the end of storms to the beginning of feast and okay. this there's such a strong connection between this epilogue very similar like i'll never amount to anything or oh, mm. what's the point there's a sense of like yeah. hopelessness between the two of them that really drives what they do and the actions they take i don't know how you felt about that or if that came up for you um i got from that very much uh there's a there's a there's almost a pre determination to this concept of the things we do for love um and you could say that that kind of encapsulates how jamie feels about cersei cersei's going to be a big feature in this book the whole thing with pate and rosie and the future that he sees and the fact that he's you know that, that it's the thing that the thing that i found interesting was the connection with the dragon so the dragon in this chapter seems to be something that's introduced as it is a concept that links to dreams and wishes so it's dreams and wishes of these this age of wonder and heroes just around the corner that awaits and and this concept of you know all of these different stories about dragons that differ but it can't be real because they're in Carth and then they're in Marine and then they're you know how can it possibly be true but in reality this is different um <clears throat> you know different um seafaring folk that are giving these stories at different times so it could pretend it could be it could be real but just the excitement of this new thing this new age and wonder is mirrored in Pate's feeling about Rosie and you know, so I, I just thought it was interesting that the 
the, the dragon, like an actual dragon and also a gold dragon coin represents these dreams and wishes. Um, and I just thought it set, set the scene quite well. I mean, yeah, I suppose you could link that back to, um, what was the previous chapter Merit, again? In? Yeah, Merit Frey's epilogue. Yeah, yeah, it's... Where he's riding along and he's like, he's he's not even in line. He will have no money once the dad is dead. And it's yeah. just like, this, like, it just, it's particularly <clears throat> when Pate steals the key and he says, you know, uh, he might as well take the silver as well, you know, yeah. he's a thief. And yeah. it's just like, why it's easier to be a thief than have these kind of ambitions that will amount to nothing because he's low born and what's the point you know he's, a, he's just going to be scrubbing yeah. you know the maester's shit from now until the yes. end of time that's what it feels like to him but it's also i think we're at that point now where we as readers we can we can afford to take a risk on drilling down on what appears to be quite insignificant characters merit mm -hmm. Pate, even um, Vladimir's six skins, I suppose, potentially, but these insignificant characters where we can really get inside their heads as well and how they're viewing their immediate surroundings and like the wider world. So we've moved away from, we've set the scene, we've got these houses, this is the, these, this is the major plots and the, the major story arcs, but we can kind of veer, we can, this is exciting because we can, we can veer a little bit off, you know, the the, the already well-trodden path to, oh, let's experiment and and fight and drill down in like, you know, and uh, this is the point in the this book where there are so many different names thrown at you that it's yeah. impossible, it's impossible to remember all of them, especially with Brienne on, and you know, and a, a kind of travel log and, um, and Sam as well, and and then you've got the Ironborn and the Do and the Dornish and all of the different new families and names and houses yeah. that you know. It's just it's it's it is just feel like a new a, a new story. If yeah, uh, it it feels well. It's very like it. It definitely feels like this was a book written before the show, and before he had the constraints of the yes. mass audience putting pressure on him. I yeah. doubt we're ever going to get this. It, it, it's a little bit indulgent at times. I love it, but I, I mm -hmm. think, it, especially when we get to the Doran chapters, it's like, whoa, 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 what? Yeah. What? This is getting too much now. Yeah. Um, at least in this prologue, there are things that we can grasp. Um, is it, where does it rank in terms of prologues for you? It's definitely up there as being one of my favorite prologues because it's just so different to the other prologues. And I think it's the most, Danny centered for prologue in the sense that it's it the only one that talks about her, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it is actually, yeah. So that makes it look a bit more exciting in this new, you know, age of age of heroes and dragons. The reason I like this prologue, probably stacked against other prologues even more, is because you get thrown some real nuggets in here of setups of okay so this these glass candles that's new this is this new mystical you know so there's th things thrown at you who's marwin what's this key about why does the alchemist want this key so there's loads of like mystery and extra new plot that's just dumped into this prologue that are like whoa okay this is something that we're going to need to probably keep continuing coming back to there's also lots of foreshadowing for other things. So very early on, we find out yes. that they're at this kind of inn slash brothel called the Quill and Tankard. And mm -hmm. uh, we learn that the Quill and Tankard hasn't closed its doors in 600 years. It's just been constantly open. It must yeah. stink. Um, yeah. But I don't know when they close. I don't know when they close to clean. In Ireland, we have Good Friday for that. Um, but it, <laughs> it's true. Uh, in... Uh, in the Quill and Tankard, it says never closed in 600 years. And it just made me think, uh, this is like, there seems to be a lot of nuggets as to old town is going to be destroyed yeah. and ransacked and brought to its knees. They're, yeah. they're too complacent at the moment. They're mm -hmm. safer than any other place that we've seen so far. They're all very comfortable. Um, they're, they're freely talking about religion and magic with no kind of 
threat of being overheard that they're talking about things that are very political whereas in Brienne's chapter later on she goes into an inn and it's there's only six people in there but it's instant suspicion yeah, instant, yeah. So it's just like we've had that's the kind of mm. inn we've seen throughout Westeros and here it's just very very different so it's it's just feels like it just feels like a completely different planet it, but it, it, it reminds of just the feel of it the way it's described it reminds me of um like oxford and cambridge you know like novices and acolytes yeah. running around running around the cobble streets and you know the the archmeisters and would be the professors and and just you know it's uh it's it's clearly an ancient place and it's the description of of the citadel is just amazing and the misty cobbles and all of the different sects um yeah and as ion yeah. points out dragon said molander which is just like it's a one word mm. uh, quote from the beginning of this pro uh, prologue and it just kind of completely makes you you switch because mm. we actually didn't have that much of the dragons we only had six danny chapters five or six danny chapters in in storm sword so it kind of does kind of get you back into oh yeah this is very fun it, it is a fantasy book i feel like storm apart from the warging it kind of did veer away from it a little bit it became more about the political intrigue but mm. here the prologue here and then when we get into dan pair's chapter as well it's like no no no, no. there is fantasy here don't forget oh, yeah, yeah. candles and all that yeah. kind of thing and even in this place that's like your oxford or cambridge it, this is they're they're concerned with this so um i guess yeah so they're all sitting around in this um inn and they are talking about the the rumors of dragons mm -hmm. and it's interesting that um molander does uh start this because he has a really interesting thing later on he he kind of says that that there's um when when people say there's stories coming from everywhere armin says there's stories coming out from everywhere what's the point you shouldn't believe any of it and he says they, he, because they all differ and Molander says only in details all speak of dragons and a beautiful young queen so it kind mm. of it reminded me of the Azora High myth that okay mm. there's lots of different types of things like that or the flood stories in our own world there's lots yeah. of different but there's evidence to suggest that with the the commonalities in those stories mm. there's a certain truth there that there mm. probably is something that we should be wary of so yeah. um this is kind of, I think this is maybe a bit of um, a, a sign from George saying you mightn't be familiar with this, with what I'm showing you here, what you're going to see in this book, but pay attention, it will all come together. Yeah, <laughs> Later yeah, on. yeah. The, the, the devil is in the details, or the dragon is in the details, I guess. Um, so I, th I think this is going to take us probably long. I'm glad we're only doing five chapters a week instead of seven, because I think we'll be picking these chapters yeah. apart from details that we might have just skipped over six or seven times before that now i'm like hang on how did i that's literally something that's like a, a massive piece of information that we've never seen before yeah dropped exactly. at the end of a sentence and then just you know it's like you just you're not going to remember those tiny little details so it's yeah it's it's fascinating this so book. i guess we'll just pick out the details rather than summarizing mm -hmm. the chapters yeah it's impossible with feasts chapters are quite dense as well so um yeah the first thing is and something that i always forget so pate is after this girl rosie whose mother is willing to sell her virginity mm. for a gold dragon and he somehow managed to get a gold dragon from this mysterious alchemist um but the alchemist was introduced to pate through rosie mm. and it makes you instantly suspicious of rosie and preston mm. jacobs had this thing about the fact that rosie gets her period and she's 15 seems a little bit late in this world mm. so th there seems to be maybe something's not all is not well here yeah. Um, yeah and I mean I I don't know if you want to talk about glass candles first or the alchemist first or where do you want to go to well and the sphinx as well and is the sphinx, that's, yeah. that's, that's something else that we need to discuss but well how about you go with the sphinx first because I don't have much on that it's heavily laden and i know this is this is probably the if you're gonna if you're gonna be going into this book series 
further than just a, a rollicking great adventure and a, a, a brilliant read and you're scratching the surface of it a bit deeper into kind of theory casting world this is an easy one to grab i think or at least it's a massive if it's not an easy one to grab then it's an it's a horrendous red herring um but these five chapters this pro the prologue and uh even to an extent cersei's chapter and definitely the captain of the guards chapter sorella is mentioned so the suns the sand snakes are introduced later on but you've got the obvious uh alaris is sorella with the words swapped around described as comely and skilled with a bow and an arrow very um it, the, he's got this strong dawnish drawl jet black hair curly hair so everything about this chapter and a little couple of clues we get later on tells us that this is a sand snake undercover for some unknown reason at this point in the citadel um and he she seems to have some information about the dragon needs to have three heads and um leads the cheer in terms of here's to daenerys which again as you say it's quite a dangerous thing to do you wouldn't you wouldn't see that any probably anywhere else in westeros people outwardly cheering for daenerys and the targaryens um so let's just leave that there the, the yeah, it seems I, as though yeah. there's a sand snake in this chapter it seems pretty like a, yeah. yeah i mean the fact that an apple as well is often associated mm. with femininity um, yeah. and she's also the app or we are led to believe later that she might have been the apple of Oberon's eye mm. there's lots of references to fruit also in um Dorne which we'll probably which we will get to obviously um mm. but yeah yeah I mean we'll, we'll come across her him again and yeah. uh, we'll, we can talk more about it yeah so um will we just talk about glass candles yeah in oh, terms yeah. of the glass candles we're told that they are uh they exist to provide a lesson so this is the purpose of the glass candles they're there to provide a lesson in truth and learning so from the meister's perspective it's that exercise in you know you're supposed to light the glass candle and do you even but and the, and the trick is you don't bother to even try because there are some things the lesson is there are some things that you will never find out and that you'll never be able to do um but leo says that he's seen a black glass candle burning there are four apparently in existence glass candles there's um one green candle and three black candles and they're also described as obsidian the black candles are described as basically they're made of dragon glass yeah um so Which is an important point later on when sam mm -hmm. meets Pate. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah it, and it, it's the so thing is the, it's made so what's in the, the shape of a, a candle so mm -hmm. when it burns what does he mean by burning because it doesn't necessarily have a wick hmm. it doesn't necessarily so what does burning mean like what does he mean by it would I, i'm the way i'm glowing to say it is it, yeah like it would glow the whole is it like those glow sticks glow. that you snap yeah 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 like it kind of glows up. <laughs> yeah uh, so armin says the glass candle is meant to represent truth and le learning rare and beautiful and fragile things it is made in the shape of a candle to remind us that a master must cast light wherever mm. he serves and it is sharp to remind us that knowledge can be dangerous which is very true mm. um true for doran at least later on yeah, um yeah. yeah it's it's i i'm not really sure how you pass the test of this I don't understand like what is the test like so the, the, the well you pass the test if you don't try even to attempt light to light it okay. be, because you 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 
at peace in the knowledge that you will never be able to know absolutely everything. There are some things that are just unknown. Um, so and I suppose in, a, in a, a, an entire sort of institution of learning, mm. the emphasis would be, you know, this is where you find out everything. This is where you can learn everything. But the harsh lesson here is actually, no, you can't. It doesn't seem like a great lesson. No, not really. Uh, and it you'd have to be, because I mean, there's examples of people cutting their hands, trying to light it, and to, but it's just like, what? That seems really silly to me. <laughs> so this is something obviously that Marwan was not satisfied with not knowing how to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder, has anyone made it burn without, has anyone succeeded mm -hmm. in making it burn? Um, but I, was, I assume they're only working now because of dragons. Yes. Uh, I yeah. I assume that. I, 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 I don't know. It seems everything is more magical now. I wonder if they relate to the fact that there's a green glass candle and three black glass candles. Do you think that might relate to dragons and maybe there's another one that will be in the story later on? Maybe. Maybe mm. they're made by different types of dragons. Mm. Um, an ice dragon, perhaps, or yeah. something like that. Um, we also get that line that obsidian does not burn. So mm. I'm guessing it's kind of like uh, Mel's ruby that kind yeah. of it's glows. Light. Mm. Yeah, it's like they call mm. it burning, but probably mm. not. Um, it's is this what the alchemist then is after? Who I I think everybody agrees. Even the wiki says this is Jack and Hagar. Um, <clears throat> so that he's after a glass candle it seems like it would have been this plan seems a bit convoluted for what he wants to do it seems like there has to be more well, to it than that if that's what he's after i would have thought that he'd just make his way up to dragonstone and go and mine some obsidian because it would be so much easier than a big convoluted plan to get into the citadel i think it's more about the um well, what what did uh, Pate mention something about the Valerian scrolls? Yeah, that there and there is um, a, a book on dragons that's only in the Citadel. I think the mm -hmm. other copy was in Winterfell and may have burned, or something like that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so it, it, it's it, Pate has this great line. Um. Pate realized dawn has come and the alchemist has not. And there's quite a couple. There's a couple of references to Dawn, and there's another one to the Citadel. Um, as the night mist burned away, Old Town took form around him, emerging uh, ghost-like from the pre-dawn gloom. Mm -hmm. So this idea that Old Town and maybe the Maesters themselves won't get to see Dawn, won't get to see the aftermath of this war. Yeah. That whatever is going to happen, there's a, every possibility that this, this this entire thing is coming down. And that makes more sense to me as to why the alchemist is going about this very convoluted plan to get inside. Mm. Um, I, I think he's, he needs to take on an unassuming character like Pate. Yeah. People never look at the person who's carrying the bucket of shit. Yeah, yeah. They don't. Yeah. They just don't. Like people don't want to look at the the shit, so they mm. kind of ignore the person. So it's better to be him than getting there via some other maester or some other kind of person that works around the citadel, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, that's it's like we were watching Shawshank Redemption recently, and it's like you know when he's when and sorry, spoiler alert, when he's escaping prison and he has that line, <laughs> nobody ever looks at your shoes. It's yeah. kind of like that. Nobody's ever going to look too closely yeah. at someone like Pate, a pig boy, basically. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's definitely for me. It seems like it's it's about bringing down the masters. Um, yeah. But I I don't know anyone in the chat. What do you think? Oh hi, Bubba. Thanks for coming along. Um, I I, I kind of think there has to be more to it than a book in a library or a glass candle. Yeah, I, and I think, I mean, I, I do hope we find out more about Marwyn in the in the Winds of Winter and find out what he's up to. I'm hoping that it was, I know there was a lot of speculation that 
Oh, Marwin will be the Meister that's in the prologue of Wins. But if that's the case, then Jane Westerling will be in the vicinity of Marwin the Major, which just doesn't seem does doesn't seem right because he seems to be on his way to Essos when we last see him. Unless he lied. Possibly, yeah, yeah, possibly. Um, but he seems like a fascinating character, and he's an archmeister as well. He's not—I didn't realise that, yeah. um, or I'd forgotten it. I thought it was just—he was just, you know, Marwin the mage, and he was a meister, or gone rogue. But no, he's actually—he's uh, actually an archmeister. I am so, says um, Jacken is Rosie confirmed? Question mark. Well, possibly, possibly, possibly yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, that would be a way if you were going to look at. Okay, I need to get a piece of information out of this city or something valuable out of this city before it's destroyed. <laughs> um, how is the best way of me going about that? Then, yeah, it'll certainly. You could imagine him setting that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bubba says, uh, or sorry, Connie says, you're on coming to Old Town, indeed. And Bubba says, mm -hmm. plus. You'd look suspicious if you disguised yourself as a real maester. Someone might ask you a question you don't know the answer to. Oh, that's yeah. very true. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly it. Um, yeah, I I kind of feel like the key is is it's nice for him to have the key, but now that he's Pate, we find out at the end of the book. Spoilers, obviously. Um, I feel like he could have just got the key. So for me, the key is just a metaphor for Pate. Pate is the key, right? Mm -hmm. He is the key. That's yeah. Right. That yeah, the alchemist needs, um, which I, I, it's it's really tragic because um, as uh, as he's walking towards meeting the, the the alchemist, he trips on the cobbles and almost mm. and and it kind of undermines his confidence, mm. and he's like, oh God, who am I kidding? Like yeah. I can't even walk properly. You know that that instant humiliation and failure that you feel when you've tripped in public and yeah. that's, he's instantly like oh who am i so it's almost like like it, it's almost like he he there's nowhere for him to go it, it's it's almost close to praying for a death which is something it, well yeah i mean i think he he's i mean he he's quite a tragic character pate because if you think of the situation the position he's in at the moment He's been a novice for five years. That's a long time to be in a situation where you're not moving forward. So he's probably having a bit of a crap time anyway, just generally. Um, everything that he's, you know, he's obsessed with Rosie, which to me sounds a bit magical, possibly. I mean, even the Quill and Tankard was described as, as selling fearsomely strong cider which made me think, are they, being, are they being slowly poisoned somehow? Um, and you've but, got the archery with Sorella yeah. at the start, so yeah. a little bit of Cupid yeah. may be going on there. <laughs> but he, at the end, he seems to have this, you know, he's like, he's thinking about this future that he knows, he, he's, he, at the same time, it's quite sad because he knows he can't have that future. So he's kind of like sliding doors, you know, he's thinking, oh, I should have done this, I should have gone and travelled, I should have done whatever. He's, it's almost like he's writing his own obituary, obituary towards the end of that chapter. Um, and there's a raven there shouting, pate, pate, which makes me think blood ravens watching all of this. Yeah, I definitely, mm -hmm. there's something not right with the raven as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I mean, it also kind of begs the question, it's the same with the Catholic Church as well, when, when somebody gets to a certain position uh, and they're still, like, he, like Archmaster Walgrave is still allowed to be an Archmaster despite the fact that he's losing his mental and physical faculties. Yeah. Um, and he's actually, he really is a danger now to the entire mm -hmm. citadel um, and old town, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So it does kind of call into question the 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 validity or the 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 productivity or purpose of these massive institutions, especially when they can't keep track of that kind of thing. So, mm. um, hey, Red Walrus, thanks for joining us. Um, 
So, yeah, so I think that's it. Just the cobblestones rushing up to kiss him at the end. Just yeah. This, that uh, coin and it's so sad as well. He doesn't know why you're supposed to boy fight the coin. Yeah. And yet that's the thing that kills him. It's like, no, oh, no. It's very sad. Yeah. Um, there's just a, a couple of things here that I picked up on. Um, I thought it was quite, it's, it, it's interesting when two small, I suppose fairly minor characters are mirroring something much bigger in the story. So you've got Leo, who I text Catherine saying, I could have sworn that Leo, lazy Leo, was a Lannister. It even seems to get like Leo the lion, lion, you know, Lannister. And it was like, oh, no, he's not actually, he's a Tyrell. But the fact that Leo Tyrell, or lazy Leo, in the in the inn, um, and uh, Alaras are, are kind of squabbling and bickering with each other, which kind of mirrors... A much bigger battle between the Tyrells and the and the and the Martells, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and um, when Pate leaves, um, and he sort of move, he leaves the group, um, and he goes off to like await the alchemist there's a there's a note here that the sphinx takes a lingering like knowing look at him and it just made me think does that mean that sorella is in cahoots oh. with jacken or the faceless man or the alchemist or whatever she seemed to she seemed to kind of like know what pate's fate was going to be that rhymes pate's fate um, but yeah, she seemed to. It was just this that she 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 took this lingering look, which made me think, mm, does she know something more than she's letting on? I mean, she's all that she's there for her games, isn't she? Just leave her yes. to her games. So yeah. what is she, you know what is she up to? Is she in cahoots with somebody? Um, I, mean, I don't that's... you know. She's not just there for like mm. summer holidays. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Is it in this chapter as well? I can't remember. That they mention not saying too much because the spider might be listening, or is that the Doran chapter? That's Doran chapter. The Sus oh yeah, yeah. It's 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 later I can't on. Remember. Yeah. There's some place where virus comes up and you're like, whoa, virus. Mm. virus is everywhere. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's that's it for me anyway, unless you have anything else on nope. the prologue. That's it. It's a pretty hefty prologue, so um we'll probably run through the other chapters. A little bit quicker, folks. But you know what? <laughs> uh, so we have the next one, The Prophet. Uh, mm. If you didn't think Feast was about religion, this mm -hmm. definitely says otherwise. And this is uh, The Prophet or Aaron 1, if you want, Dampere 1, whatever you want mm -hmm. to say. And um, I, I, I particularly like the constant references and the division between you know the 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 iron islanders and the greenlanders um mm. and I, my my the thing i've learned from aaron is that you don't trust people who don't want to get their boots wet that's that's uh, that's the big thing <laughs> um so ion says this is the best prologue actually for him so that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. um yeah it is a great prologue to be fair it's very different from the other ones as well which are more i, I they lean into the horror a little bit more as well, the other ones, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, this one is just more about the intrigue and world building. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so we have Aaron here and, uh, yeah, Damp Hair, where do you want to start with this? Well, as we know, Damp Hair is a very pious character, so this, this chapter really drills down into that, into his beliefs into what into his faith i mean this is a, a guy who was a prior just complete degenerate alcoholic um and you know so usually the even more pious so the you know he's a kind of born again yes born again iron born um so it's it's almost you know it's the, the the um the connection that he has to his faith seems even stronger um but yeah I, I i actually didn't make many notes on this chapter 
yeah and there's I mean, a few things that i got from it just from more of a sense of the culture of the ironborn they're just completely different the way that cool. they the way that they see everything the way they speak the way they and and i came to the conclusion that it for me it does feel that the ironborn culture just seems more ancient more oh it's been like it's been there a longer time than the rest of westeros it feels i get more, this feeling that they're it's ancient it's, it's harder as well um mm. it's it's a harder life i mean when you look at the followers of damp hair who are really like they they're as um dedicated as you know the followers of Rolor or the sparrows later on and yet damp hair seems to be the maddest of like these mm -hmm. religious leaders and yet he's the, really the only one that people want to make king like his followers are willing to go as far as making him king mm -hmm. and it seems like there it seems like it's so hard to live there that you kind of you grasp anything you can to get by uh, and just his description of you know that the amount of siblings he had and how difficult yeah. it was just to make it into adulthood yeah. um and i i completely forgot about the story with yori about you know that he was the one that he's the reason yori's dead um, which, you know, that and the sexual abuse, is, they, yeah. they compounded to, to make him this alcoholic, I guess. Um, but there's all like, sorts of... He's, he's a product of... It, it's, there just seem to be so many characters here introduced in these five that are almost like the, the, the product of PTSD, including Cersei later on, where it's like how should I behave in this situation and it's like that's not a that that's somebody who's like there's 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 I wouldn't I'm not going to say damage <laughs> but yeah. there's a problem there you know if you find yourself in a situation that's highly emotional and the first thing that you think of is how should I be behaving in this situation there's some trauma that's gone on there for you in in the past and I would argue and, that with Arya I think Aaron is the best written character of somebody mm. who's suffered a terrible trauma that yeah. has been or a number of traumas that have been compounded over the years. Like mm. in this chapter, he goes from this misfounded um, sense of um, uh, confidence almost and mm. distancing himself from the body that was abused. So he yeah. puts himself on this higher a religious kind of a scale um mm. and then we also have him being very depressed and anxious and mm. also an incredible amount of repression unlike anything we've seen probably so mm. far i would argue mm -hmm. um but the, the way george writes this character i find him very rewarding and mm. um i know there are a lot of people hate these chapters but i think if you haven't read them in a while go back to this early chapter. It is really rewarding. There's a lot of foreshadowing for what happens in the Forsaken chapter here, especially yeah. with the idea that on the ram of his ship, he was going to put like this, a penis. That's the mm. suggestion. He was going to put a penis on the ram of his ship until Balon said he'd hang him for it. And mm. it's just now that we know what happens to him later, yeah, it's like, yeah. whoa, like all yeah. of this foreshadowing has led to the point where you were sexually abused to try and kind of take charge of that mm -hmm. and then to be taken charge of it again like somebody again Euron comes in and takes charge of it maybe had he stood up to Balon maybe it would be different yeah um yeah. so there's just so it's very very layered oh, I imagine yes. that yeah. George and George obviously thinks deeply on everything that he he writes for sure but I think Every word in the in this chapter in particular is very careful, and I felt that with the Forsaken chapter too, very mm -hmm. very carefully chosen, um, and especially those references to the abuse that he suffered from Euron. Yes, and also the, one of my favorite at this, just oh. again that like you know the PTSD sort of and being triggered at things like the sound of, uh, the sound of hinges and you know the, the sound of like clanging metal or just is 
it, it is very i agree it's very layered I and guess. very uh compounded with diff, you know complexity and it's almost like he's designed his own way of recovery mm -hmm. that helps give him a purpose for life but at the same time he must be absolutely shitting himself that you're on his back. <laughs> and but let's, let's he, not forget that, like, you know, he's George, got his friend, man. Yeah, but like, George is hugely influenced by the Catholic Church here yeah. with these like green baptisms mm. and with mm. the seven as well. There's faults with both of them. But in mm -hmm. 2005, when he's writing this, like, I think the first scandals with the Catholic Church and sexual abuse started breaking in the late 90s, mid right. to late 90s. So by 2005, there would have been a lot of conversation and literature about the effects sexual abuse have on, on a person. And mm. I'm sure he did his research on this and definitely put it front and center as the first chapter to draw attention to the yeah. dangers of institutional abuse or religious abuse or even just familial abuse. Yeah. Which I feel like we don't talk enough about as a culture. He's he's like this because of his brother. Yeah, it's not because of his religion. He's turned to his religion for comfort. And I love the. I mean, there's a couple of lines that just draw his that inform his character. And I know I'm spending a long time talking about this, but without this happening to him, we don't have this religious following. Not only that, we don't have a king's moot without this happening to the, yeah to damn pair. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he says that he was weak and full of sin, which is such a thing. Like George doesn't usually use the word sin mm -hmm. in, in in this series, um, and that is clearly something that you would hear from. That's uh, something you hear often from people who've gone yeah. through sexual sexual abuse in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he also talks about memories being the bones of the soul, which is just yes, yeah, yeah, brilliant. yeah, just so good. So that was the answer, Bones. He prays for an answer to mm -hmm. give the Ironborn some kind of a, an idea of who the successor should be. And that's the answer, Bones, Nagger's Bones. Um, so what does the... I mean, I suppose the questions I've got here are, there's this underlying feeling for me as well as the description of Aaron and everything that he's gone through and the relationship with his brothers and what he thinks is going to be best for the for, for the ironborn he feels that they should go back to the old ways and there's there's very much uh so there's a feeling here that whatever happens Aaron is never going to be rooting for Asher to be leading the ironborn because first of all he says no woman shall sit the iron throne and no godless man shall sit the iron throne so those are his i think he would probably you know more easily accept even euron above asher and he's talking about the old ways and the old ways are very much going back to you know we shall not so we do not so and and the, the, and you know the reaving and thralls and just you know that's how they build their power but they're such a they do feel underneath all of that they do feel for me probably like the most ancient culture just like they've been there longer and there's something about them that's almost the culture is so different that it, it kind of feels like they're not I'm not trying to say that they're uncivilized, but it is it just feel like they're not as developed yeah. as 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 like hum, humanoid kind of you know beings than other cultures. Even you know just just anywhere, there's just something almost unnatural about them as it's, as a race. It's very like there are certain islands off the coast of Ireland that you know. It's even hard for trees to take root there because it's mm. so windy and it's so brutal to live there. Mm. And you kind of pare down your civilization to absolutes and um, kind of from the outside, less nuanced versions of politics and morality. Yes. And yeah. that's what he's doing with the Asha thing. Yeah. And 
it's it's a pity that he doesn't trust Greenlanders even a little bit because he has the answer. He knows Euron would be terrible. He even says it himself. Better to be uh, scorned by Balon than beloved by Euron. Like he yeah. knows how dangerous it is to have Euron in that mm-hmm. position. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just pairs it down to this really simple, you know, no woman. It has to be a man. He, he reads mm-hmm. everything really literally and um, to to do his duty, I guess, as as a religious mm. leader. Um, which is which is later on the complete opposite. So we get yeah. two very different cultures, the, the Dornish um yes. are pushing actually for for a, a, fe- a female leader. So it's um yeah, two two very, very, very different people but and both cultures. In a way defined by the environment that they're in. Both are in very extreme mm-hmm. environments. You know, mm. Dorne is drying up, whereas the Iron Islands are getting wetter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. I, f- I find it interesting on the back of the, the Citadel chapter that Euron's view of, because there are a few Meisters in yeah. in the Iron Islands um, with more, more of the like up-jumped houses that like to call themselves lords. But they're, you know, they're, they're ironborn. Um, but he he describes them as chain necked thralls, mm. and he doesn't understand how they basically volunteer for a life of servitude. Mm. They're, you know, essentially they're thralls, and he just doesn't he doesn't trust them because he doesn't quite understand why they would do that. Which is it, it's a valid and genuine question why you know what uh, you would think that wouldn't you who are these but you know why would you do that why would you give you your life up like that when you can you know you you can serve the drowned god instead but um yeah there's just something that's very ancient about this whole yeah again we kind of touched on the seasons and nature and geology and stuff but this whole you've got the sea and you've got the sky and they've been at war for centuries and when the storms come it can only you know they've got everything about how they view life and on the basis of their religion is down to the elements and, and you know storms maybe, raging maybe i'm underestimating because maybe you know if he doesn't do anything euron will come in and just take the throne anyway because mm. he has picked this time when ash is away to move and yeah. take the throne. But mm-hmm. by calling a king's moot, Aaron is at least opening up the question that he isn't fit to rule, or mm-hmm. at least, you know, giving the Iron Man something to think about yeah. in the event that they need to overthrow this guy or get rid of him. Um, so I think he's thinking I'm, Victorian, maybe, isn't he? He is thinking That's, Victorian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in fairness, Victorian isn't a bad choice at this stage. Asha is the best choice, but Victorian mm-hmm. isn't a bad choice. Um, definitely, Euron is. He, we also have that line, you know, that the storm go- god took Balon, and Euron thinks he's a god. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. What do you think? I suppose the only question I've got uh, now on this chapter is, what do you think is a big one? What do you think the origins are, or the meaning of those? words that because it's more the religion than like you know the house great joy words the what is dead may never die yeah i don't know is it something to do with the faceless men is there something because uh they have different gods right the iron islands mm. and they seem to have a god for anything it seems very convenient to their gods like it's almost as convenient as the many face god like there's many faces to your god Mm. I don't know. I'm not sure what his dead may never die. I mean, he certainly, he's not traumatized by killing his brother, Yori. He's traumatized by the sexual abuse that he was, that he was, that he endured, which Mm. makes me think that they have a much um, healthier relationship with death than Mm. most of the rest of Westeros. Um, They don't seem to see death as a final thing. Because maybe mm. maybe because they send them away to sea, it's very Viking like. Yeah, that way. yeah, um, yeah. But like it, it is like that in in certain parts of Ireland as well, where you know people will talk about loved ones that have died as if they're still around. 
right the older people um, and yeah. the way it was in ireland you know because mortality rates were quite high in ireland and it's the same in the iron islands so yeah, to just yeah. get through that grief you need to kind of believe that what is dead may never die as long as you if yeah. memories are bones of the soul then they'll always be around mm, so mm. maybe that's what yes very interesting yeah I'd... more fantastical to it i think potentially the sea stone chair especially if you think about the history of the sea stone chair that was that pre seems to predate absolutely anything ever um and nobody seems to know where that came from i think the fact that they worship things that are under the sea and this whole concept that we have of humanity even on the simpsons homer will be like we'll be all right when we live under the sea there's this feeling of um there's you know the lord god who drowned for us and when we die we will get our treasures in and rewards in his, in, in his watery halls and all, you know it almost feels like is there a race or a culture of people that lives like deep underneath that you know like the like the the children of the forest live deep underground in the earth maybe there is something like underneath the yeah. I mean, the, the Earth's crust. I mean, um, you didn't mention it, but mermaids come up in the prologue. The story yeah. of sailors yeah. sleeping about mermaids, mm -hmm. so it's quite possible. I mean, Aaron seems to think that he has died. His body died. Mm -hmm. which, that Aaron died. Um, so, yeah, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know. I think there's something quite mystical and ancient about the Ironborn that we haven't discovered yet. And maybe we never will. Maybe it'll just be one of those things that we kind of deliberate over in years to come that we'll never quite get an answer to. But they're just so different. There's just that small gulf that separates them from like Casterly Rock, really, in the, you know, the Western coast. But they're just so different. It's, um, it's I, I, I find them fascinating. It's possible as well. Um, Ireland is quite unique culturally, like the language and things like that, because, and the, similar with Scotland actually, but because the Romans never came to Ireland. Mm. I mean, they sent scouts, but they never took over Ireland. It might be the same with the Iron Islanders, not just, you know, the Andals, the first men or anything like that, but maybe it's something to do with the, the long night or the mm -hmm. fact that they've never had white walkers come to them, mm -hmm. that, that their culture has never had to reinvent itself. So yeah. there could be something to that as well, that that's why they seem so unique. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's it for Aaron for a while. And yep. uh, then we move to Dorn mm. and uh, Ariel and the captain of the guards. So, whew. Um, this, yeah, I guess this... it's a nightmare to kind of summarize. I guess the best thing to do is to either look at them like as characters, or I don't know. There's so much. Well, there's, there's 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 lots of themes in this chapter. You've got the immediate, and it's very emotional. So you've got vengeance versus potentially the long game, which Doran might be playing. If it is the long game, what you know, who knows how long it's going to be. It, it's made very apparent in this chapter that he's an old and quite ill man. So uh, how long is he going to keep this thing to himself? There's some similar to Hoster. Yes. There's some weird things going on around. And, and I don't think it's just because, you know, he won't immediately back the Sand Snakes in their quest for war and vengeance. I think there's something a bit freaky going on with Doran when he th starts thinking about his past and talking about his past to um, Aero Hotar, Can the, I cap just... the captain of the guards. I mean, it just there's yeah, there's I've got quite a few questions. So uh, the, I just want to point out first thing structurally about this chapter. It's one of the um, 
it's it's a chapter that takes place over a long period of time mm. which we don't really get in this series mm. and i think that's to point to the fact that doran's plans take a really long time yeah. and they are very complex and they are very they do have a lot of you know moving parts and everybody is involved in this because there are so few dornish people they, it seems like everybody is directly affected by this and we mm. have that with this theme of fruit, right? With mm -hmm. this, the, the opening line, the blood oranges are well past ripe and they're falling on the ground. And it, that could be read one of two ways. Like the, the best plans are sweetest when they're just allowed to, to yeah. ripen or he has waited too long. Yeah. Yeah. And he, now the fruits of his labor are kind of falling and smashing yeah. to the ground as the yeah. sand snakes are. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sand snakes are out of control in this chapter as well. I mean, you feel a bit sorry for him. If, yeah, I feel sorry for him in this chapter. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. I like him and I hope the purpose of Dorn. I hope there's a purpose to Dorn. Um, yeah, I hope there's a purpose to Dorn. I can see the purpose in the Iron Islands, but the purpose of Dorn right now is a little bit lost on me as we go into winds a little bit. Um, so yeah we have this this symbolism of the oranges um they also show geographically how much there's a conflict in dorn you've got yeah. like the really ripe our gardens the, the beautiful fruits and ario comments on the, the smell of it and he even dreams about them yeah. and then when they get to sun spear it's just dusty and dry and you know it's just it's very different he doesn't want yeah. to be there um but yeah, I, something about Doran doesn't sit right with me. In a, in um such in in a part of Westeros that has fresh fruit and has the has a better standard of nutrition, you'd expect mm -hmm. than other parts of Westeros. I don't understand how he's so gouty. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's. It can't be just his wealth because he seems like he'd be smarter than that. Is it gout or is there something else going on? Was he poisoned at one stage? Or <laughs> we know we're going to be known as the podcast who accuses everyone of being poisoned. Or well, is there something in that cider? Or yeah. <laughs> but again, possibly was Hoster poisoned? Yeah, I, I think. I think the reason that he is, oh, and it's very, it, in the TV show, it, it did, you know, again, it, it didn't seem as apparent, but he's really not well. No. He can barely walk. Anything touching his skin is really, really painful. And Aero Hotar, as well as being this fearsome captain of the guards, is also his carer. Does he have a maester? He, d he does have a maester he ha who's, who's mentioned in this chapter, actually. Abara just brushes him to one side. I can't, I can't, Cressida, is it? Cressida? Or something seen, like that? Oh, that's right. It just, um, yeah. uh, if, if Wyman Manderley can get on a horse, Doran yeah. shouldn't be suffering this much from gout. And I know traditionally gout it was quite like a difficult disease to get through, but mm. I don't know. It's, it seems a little bit... I don't know. There's, it's not the, his illness seems to be uh, something else. There seems to be something else going on. And I mean, we've got lots of images of Doran. Just, I mean, he seems to be in a deep depression all the time as well. And um, yeah, it makes me wonder: is there something more going on with him? Maybe not just physically, but mentally. Like that, he's he's constantly in a state of depression. Perhaps. I mean, he while all of these spinning parts are happening he spends long periods of time just watching kids playing that sounds weird but mm. it's him reminding himself why he's doing this and maybe reminding himself why he's suffering so much mm. because it's, mm. that's the future i need to save dorn that's the future playing in the garden that's what i need yeah. to save and um, yeah that's how i how i see it i don't know if you see it some differently but mm. I uh, the Order of the Green Hand again did a, a podcast about 
Doran and the Martells. I think they did like a, a series. And they pointed out that, and, and, and it jumped out at me actually in this chapter about Doran saying that he was the oldest and the last. And again, in the middle of a sentence, neatly dropped in is that um, babies died in their cradles. So he did have similar to the similar actually to uh, damp hair, you know, nine sons, and he repeats it about three times in the chapter, nine sons were spawned from the loins of Kellen um, Greyjoy. With the Martells, there was only Doran, Doran for quite a long time before, and, there, and, he, and he slips into the conversation, babies died in the cradles. Uh, his mother got pregnant with Elia when she wasn't anywhere near Sunspear. So she had the baby and the baby lived. And then later, and then a little bit later, she had Oberon. So he had two siblings, but for quite a long time, it was just him. And the fact that he mentions that babe, oh, isn't it sad babies as well that died in the cradles. I was the oldest and the last. So of course my notes are, how did the babies die in the cradles? Uh, how, uh, did, did Doran kind of know that Elia was gonna die and that Oberon was gonna die at some point? He's very, there's a lot of grief in this chapter, a lot of grief. He doesn't even open the letter that comes to him, you know, but, but by the raven. He doesn't open it till the very last. He seems to already know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, he um, does, and maybe, maybe he has some way of knowing. You know, the theme of this chapter is the sand snakes keep coming up repeatedly. It was murder. Oh, my father was murdered. Oberyn was murdered. And you're just going to sit there, and each time he says. No, it was a legitimate, it wasn't murder, it was trial by combat. No, it wasn't murder. And he tells each one of them, it comes up three times, Sand Snake 1, Abara, Sand Snake 2, Nymeria, Sand Snake 3, Tyene. Each of them in their own, you know, Fox, Firefox 5 way or whatever, tell him that their father was murdered and he comprehensively says to each of them, no, he wasn't. And he's right. <laughs> Yes, legitimately. And he is right. And could Oberyn, that have been Oberyn, set up? Oberyn cheated in a trial by combat. Yes. Like would would that is is that is that always going to be something that's inevitable if Oberyn turns up at King's Landing under any circumstances that he's going to want to murder the mountain? Yes. And this is a the, the, and sending him under those circumstances would be the prime opportunity because we could sit here and say absolutely no way Oberyn did this of his own volition he put himself forward everyone was shocked including Tyrion my god that he's going to be the the champion against the mountain but it was there is some kind there is some sort of inevitability about this and Doran seems to me in a weird hosterish kind of way a bit guilty of fucking around with his family here or, on, a, on a certain level because or he's dealing with a family that like there's something there's something not quite right with Oberyn I, I really like Oberyn but there's right. something that I noticed with this one that I hadn't really noticed before um when when we get a bit of background to Obara who's 30 I didn't mm. realize she was that old actually mm -hmm. um, she's 30 she isn't very attractive which is not a problem but it's also a bit surprising because Oberyn was quite attractive mm. um, but when her mother the a prostitute shows up with her as a kid and says this is your child mm. or sorry she she tries to claim it isn't his child is that it yeah and, and he then, throws the sword down and says, is, "Your mother's she, tears are my spear, basically." Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it's just like how he's very eager to claim bastards over it. Yeah, and you know the thing that the, <laughs> the thing that just made me think that's just horrible is 
Obara, when she's relating this story, it, it, it's like she's proud almost that a mother yeah. drank herself to death. Yeah. It was this like, and and that's how she ended up. You know, that's what happened to her. You know, and it's like, but that was your that was your mother, and the reason that she drank herself to death was because she couldn't stop crying. That you you know your father came and wrenched you away from her, it's, and you, it's almost like she was kind of explaining that like it was some sort of badge of honor. Yeah. Is Freaky. Lauren aware of something, some genetic trait? within the martels that's dangerous like we yeah. have in the targaryens where you've had that you like you flip a yeah. coin yeah. and it could go either way yeah. and there seems to be this uh, like impetuousness and mm. slant towards instant vengeful violence that mm. the sand snakes have that Ariane can be pushed away from yeah. Ariane seems to be the only one that can actually weigh up things logically Mm -hmm. Not that Oberon wasn't smart, he's incredibly smart, but there does seem to be some sort of pathology to Oberon. We mm. don't have the benefit of being in his head, so we can't know, but it seems to me like Doran is carrying something on behalf of this family mm. that, you know, he he seems to have, he, it, it's pointless explaining this to them because they're, they're yeah, but he is it. He is the oldest and the last, yeah. and if he is playing this long game, he needs to be able to pass this information on so that somebody else can fulfill this whatever this long game is so oh, it's, it's hard to know with doran when later on in the book when he does bring his daughter into his plan if you even know whether he's telling her the truth or not there's just but 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 there's also something that's like why wouldn't he He's going to need to invest in somebody at some point, Doran. He has to because it's been the way he's, he's been written as a character is he's very old, he's very frail, he's very ill. And at any point, you know, he, he, he may not survive. Just that, you know, the delicate way that Aero is like carrying him around and he seems to be this like live-in carer for him as well as like outwardly the guard. So it is interesting that um, Doran wasn't around when Ellie was born, and um, we have we know from Oberon that him and Elia and the mother travelled while they were young, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which suggests that they were around, they were away from Doran a bit, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that a purposeful thing to keep them out of Doran? Um, are they are they are they full like are they full siblings? Doran mm -hmm. and Oberon and Elia. Um, it also makes me question, because they're all so impetuous, these guys, and Elia and Oberon were very close and very similar from what Oberon says, even though he says she's very sweet, they they seem to be very close, like Cersei and Jaime. Mm. Um, we have the story that Ares kept, I believe this is true, that Ares keeps Elia in, in King's Landing rather than sending her away. I think there at some stage there's mention of it's been mm -hmm. suggested that he should send her away, but he doesn't. That why were they all kept in one place? Because that was a kind of a stupid thing to do. Maybe I'm making this up. This could be my own head canon. canon. Anyway, my my question is, was there a, a time when Doran sent word to Elia, come to King, come back from King's Landing while the war is on? come to the safety of Doran and we'll look after you and did she maybe say no nah, I'm fine I'm staying here I have a right to be here what was it that kind of like anytime he tries to tell these people to do something that's good mm. for their own good they do the opposite mm. yeah so maybe I wonder, did something happen with Elia um obviously she was you know treated mm. terribly or whatever but I thought there was something about Aries keeping them kind of hostage, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I could be. I could be. Interested. I don't know. Ray, Rainella, but Rainella, that's his wife, right? Aries is Rainella, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't mm. seem to make sense as to why Rhaegar wouldn't have sent Elia and the kids to Dorne or somewhere for safety. Yeah, 
why why keep her so it makes me wonder did Elian refuse to leave or did something I don't know or did Doran not take her for some and reason? why is Doran's wife not why is she living in a different country a different it's continent very, there's a lot is that because something happened between between her and King Eris like he raped her or you know, I mean he was no, crazy no. there's a lot of questions about Doran um that I feel we can't have too many answers to, obviously, because mm. I think they'll give us too much mm. insight into his plans. But there's a reason, I, there has to be a reason why Elia was kept in King's Landing. If anyone knows, tell mm -hmm. me. Um, yeah, so uh, so let's just run through the stand stakes. Over, Obara, as I said, she's the, the daughter of the prostitute and mm -hmm. Obara, and she wants to march on King's Landing, right? That's her mm -hmm. plan. That's what she wants. She wants to gather as many people as possible. And indeed, she goes to Sunspear and gets all the, the people riled up before mm -hmm. Doran arrives. Um, then, oh no, sorry, she doesn't want to go to King's Landing. She wants to sack Old Town. Apologies. Why does she want to sack Old Town? She hates Old Town because that's where she, you know, the, her mother was an Old Town whore. Um, and she's described as hating Old Town as much as their little sister, Sorella, loves it. Yeah, so I don't understand that at all. That's yeah. a weird one. Is yeah. that jealousy that Oberon maybe encouraged Sorella to go to Old Town and not her or something? I don't know. Mm. Or Sorella maybe was a favourite and she wasn't. Uh, being the oldest, maybe she felt she should be. Yeah. Uh, then we have Lady Nim, who just wants to assassinate the Lannisters, the, the, yeah. the twins, Tywin. At, this, so this is before Tywin has died, right, chronologically? Yes. Or at least they don't know. It's before he's. No, him. because they don't know because, in fact, Doran is hoping that Tywin will find out that he's still, you know, a faithful servant. Yeah, um. So she's she's just vengeance and hidden knives. Yes. Nymeria. So she's the one that's got the. That, that's her sort of special power. And then we have <laughs> Tyeen and Lady Nim was uh was the daughter of a highborn lady, isn't that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then we have Tyeen, who is the daughter of a Septa. Septon? Septa. Yeah. Septa. And uh, she just wants to uh, crown Mar Marcella, marry her to Tristan, and draw the Lannisters to Dorne. Mm -hmm. Seems like yeah. a great idea. Well done, Tyeen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, all these ideas are mad. I mean, Lady Nims, you can kind of see, but I don't know how they're going to achieve it. Well, all of them, they is they, they is you know vengeance and war, in different ways. Obara is outright warfare, whereas with Tyeen, it's a bit more passive aggressive. She's the poisoner, you know, so that's her special talent. Um, she has these like robes with little bits of poison and things. In fact, just there was a point that I missed previously with in with Pate actually. The description of his cloak which uh, and i just thought that's very the meister's cloak does seem quite similar to the mummer's cloak which also is designed to have these little secret pockets mm -hmm. and things in but anyway yes she is uh that she's the the poisoner that's her weapon and then we obviously have ariane who will we we'll mm -hmm. learn more about it later. Uh, Barbara says the dornish were marching to join the war and Ares wouldn't let Ares wouldn't let um, Ellie and the kids leave King's Landing. That's what I thought. I thought mm -hmm. there was something to, that he was holding them as hostage. And Connie said that as well, that Ares wanted Dorne yeah. to help with the rebellion, so they were as hostages. I wonder, mm -hmm. is there more to that? Because it, it was... Obviously, we kind of... Doran doesn't really have the numbers to give any mm. kind of hopes to anyone. Um, but it seems like he sacrificed Elia as well, a little bit. Um, mm. In the chaos of war, would it have been possible to at least get the kids out, especially with Rhaegar's help? Like, yeah, could he have gotten word to Rhaegar? Let's we're going to break the kids out and bring them to Dorne for their own safety. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe I'm just being, but it just seems like these are a very talented bunch of women, especially with mm. Oberyn still in the picture at that stage. Yeah, you would have imagined that o Oberyn would have moved hell or high water to get her out of there. Mm -hmm. And maybe they just never believed that King's Landing would fall. Maybe it was that simple. 
And yeah. our Elia and the kids, Aries host a, a, a hostages to keep Rhaegar faithful. Yeah, well, that's true as well, because Rhaegar was probably planning his a coup before Robert's rebellion. But mm. um, I, I don't know. There's, I think it'll be something will be revealed maybe with that storyline as well. Um, so yeah, so they they move then to Sunspear, and I mean we we haven't really talked very much about the POV. <laughs> uh, the yeah, I just the, the is is he? Um, I mean this this thing about him being branded and being told in Novos, uh, keep your keep your long axe sharp, which he always did. Um, and he does seem, like I've said already, to be like a, a kind of carer almost to um, to Doran. But is he? He seems enslaved. Uh, and you know, it's all I, I can't get the. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of an unsullied. Very much so. Yeah, he talks about the men with the beards. Who who is that? Is that? Yeah, there's these priests you know with the beards. There are, so you know those priests. No, I, I don't know, but I mean, uh, he, ju he also seems to have a, a very like. There's a huge, huge foreshadowing here um, about him killing Ares Oakheart. In fact, he predicts it. He has a sad. He has this sad feeling that they will end up fighting, and if that's ha if that happens, um, Oakheart won't. You know, he won't survive it. He put his axe through his head. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so that's just you know he just outright predicts that happening, but he's also quite sad about it. And he, um, said, he seems he, to have a crush on Ariane as well. Yeah, mm, um, little princess. I mean, <clears throat> he is one of the few characters that is able to go to sleep dreaming of blood oranges if he wants. Mm, I mean, mm. as enslaved as he is, there seems to be a freedom from the kind of uh, suffering that the others are going through. Mm. Whether like he he doesn't seem as tormented as the people that he's with. I mean, Doran. It sounds like Doran rarely sleeps. The sand snakes are always bouncing around. I have this image of the sand snakes as the Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, um, yeah. Only less violent. Just like jumping around. I think um, Fox Force Five from oh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Yes, thank ah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's but, yeah, 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 yeah. But she, um, yeah. This is it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it 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 could be that. There's a message. There's a, a, a comment here from Sonny Fake Aegon. And if you think about it, does Doran have involvement in that plot? He must have. Yes. If you, if we if we're thinking that he is somehow manipulating his own siblings, and Varys. Oh. Sorry, oh, could you just say that again? That, just yeah. Um, I was saying that if we're, what we're saying is that Doran manipulates his relationship with his siblings and maybe uh, he was involved in Oberon being murdered and that this is somehow further in his plan as the last and oldest Martel, whether or not he has some involvement in Elia's children, like uh, uh, Sonny Frank here is saying fake Aegon, question mark. I think he, because he, he's effectively Aegon's uncle, isn't he? That's, you know, that's, fam that's Elia's child. So he must, part of his plot must have something to do with Aegon, fake Aegon. I, I can't get it out of my head that there's something, there's something Doran knows, there's some flaw Doran is aware of. Mm. And if Elia mar married a Targaryen, that doubles the chances that your, your kids are gonna be a bit mad. Mm. And mm. I don't know, it's just the way he treats the Sand Snakes as well. And by the way, he's, he's, he's every right to treat them like this. 
but also is he just being very dishonest about like why doesn't he be a more honest about the state of the 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 state of the country the state of their state like the mm. condition that they're in the threat that they're under yeah who who is it that he doesn't trust i mean he's refusing painkillers even though he's in absolute agony because he says he i need my wits about me so I think Preston is the Order of the Green Hand or Preston Jacobs or something posited that, that Order of the Green Hand posited he's that he's uh, killed all his siblings. I think to be the, the only that the reason he doesn't take painkillers is because that he might be using a glass candle, and oh. that he needs to keep his wits about him. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's that oh, it was right. the Order of the Green Hand that suggested that. Mm. I definitely there's, there's something more going on here. There's definitely something more going on because if you think about it, um, people are the like a lot of characters are often in pain when they're at their most telepathically mm. like capable um, or their best. So we have Bran obviously who's physically can't walk or whatever. Mm. John when he was in pain a lot with his leg, and also when he's in a lot of emotional pain that seems to be the best point for him to work same with aria mm. so there might be something to that um you could I, look I, at I this know. you could look at this chapter and say here is someone who killed his baby siblings who set up his the only reason that his other siblings survive is because they were born nowhere near him um he was involved in the murder than the uh, that it was a setup with Oberon and it wasn't you know it would he'd been he'd been placed in that trial by combat therefore it was a murder um and you could also say equally in that regard that when he sends Quentin away that he's doing it as a, it's almost like a suicide mission he's completely expecting that he's never going to see his son again and he sent him away to die why yeah. so why is he doing this why is he killing off his own relatives or is it just or are his, they you know relatives? for their own for the, yeah or is it just you know i'm doing this for your own good that's the sense that you get when this order at the end of the chapter just lock them all up I all mean, eight of them all eight of the sand snakes and then we get again sorella dropped into well what about sorella do we need do i need to go and seize her she's because she's not there she's off on you know and he says leave her to a game which then makes me think you might have made a massive mistake there doran not 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 lining your ducks up properly and one has slipped through and maybe sorella eventually later on in the game we'll is yeah. is the person that will yeah she'll unless do it he's working with sorella or unless he mm -hmm. knows that she's not going to get out of there live um but mm. the, the, the answer might actually be in ariel a hotel like mm -hmm. it might actually like you said it yourself he sounds like he's enslaved and as i mm. said he's almost free within that slavery because mm. he doesn't have to he, he he's very unsully like in this in the sense that he's very single-minded and focused you need to sharpen the axe and just go to sleep mm. and my axe is my wife and it's yeah. like he's unburdened with that and i think maybe the answer is in that for doran the individual is unimportant mm. for the survival of the group and he has to deal with these very strong individuals these very very different individuals that are obstacles to his plans for the survival of the group that is mm. Doran. and mm. I, we will we will recommend one more time the order of the green hand they do a great video on the origins or, or the the rebellion Dorne put up against Aegon and mm. the conquest and how they kind of gave them the runaround for years mm. um, within the deserts of Dorne. So uh, the group seems to be paramount for him. It's not about the individual. Um, yeah. And as they're, they're, Connie points out, did Doran's wife go back to Norco because Doran gave Quinton to the Ironwoods as a hostage and she was pissed mm. um, and nervous sorry yeah yeah she maybe yeah and Barbara agrees um, but mm. it's strange she didn't stay to raise Ariane and the younger son 
I can't remember his name, Tristan. Um, but mm. yeah, there's something um, something a bit weird there as well. Again, yeah, I mean, Doran seems to see something in Ariane. Ariane is willing to sacrifice people for a plan. So is Doran. So, whereas Oberyn, Oberyn isn't necessarily that cutthroat, as mad as he is. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there anything else then with this chapter? No, um, just, well, does Doran want, I'm just wondering whether or not it would be in his plan. Is it? Is it? Is it in his interest or is it against his plan for Tywin to be dead? Better the devil you know, I think. Yeah, I mean, he just, he seems to be making a great big thing about, you know, all of the crowd in Sunspear are screaming, vengeance for the Viper, vengeance for the Viper. And then he's got his own family to deal with. And he's got, you know, he's weary, he's heavy hearted, there's grief here. The, the, you know, he seems to sort of like, don't tell me about things about my brother. It's like there's, there's sort of, you know, there's, there is something there, even if he was responsible for sending Oberon off to his death. Um, I thought it was really sad, the sad bit for me in this chapter was when he was saying look at the children to Abara right at the beginning he was saying look at the children and she didn't want to and he commanded her to look at the children and he tells her about a story when Oberon used to like trip the, bit, the bigger boys and like make them topple into the pool and when he left to go to King's Landing he said to, to Doran I'm going to topple a bigger boy one last time so did he mean the mountain did he mean Tywin did he it would I mean it's sad because at that point when he said that Oberon must have known and also Doran must have known that he was destined to die in King's Landing um so I just thought that was really sad yeah yeah uh, I mean I mean we don't have the benefit of ever really knowing Oberyn. Um, the show has did a good job of kind of having a caricature of Oberyn, mm. but and as great as that actor was in the show, and he was he was phenomenally good. One, of, I think, probably the last great addition of a major character for me, anyway, as an actor. Although there's been a few, Ed Sheeran, mm. for instance, but um, I think we didn't get the intellect. That mm. Oberon undoubtedly had, mm. um, and there could be a whole other plan where they sacrifice themselves. We've even, you know, talked about the theory that Shay could have been a, mm. a, a, a Sandsake or, or a Martell or a Dornish woman of some sort. Um, mm. Although I do have a tinfoil theory coming up on Shay. Well, I um, want to ask a question actually about that, about the numbers, because I'm like, it's just somebody missing here, which automatically makes me think about Shay. But yeah. there's five grown sand snakes, and we've got Obara, and we see three Obara, Nymeria, Tyene, Sorella is mentioned. Who's the other one? Obara, Nymeria, Tyene. Sorella. Yeah, I don't know. I don't Who's know. The fifth, who Who's the fifth one? Do we ever find out? Did you say something? Who the fifth one is? Sneezy. Sneezy, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Sneezy or sleepy. Gouty. So who, yeah, gouty. Who is the other sand snake? Well, uh, I think am Shay... I just having a complete brain fart know. here? Because if it is Shay. Uh, yeah, that I'll would look it up. That would be quite it. interesting. I I do think that um, when it comes to there are younger there are younger ones, but the yeah. older there are five older sand snakes. I think there are three younger ones because so, he orders all eight of them to be taken into custody. I'll look it up on the app okay. that I actually. Paid a whole four francs for. Um, um, so the one thing I yeah. wanted to ask you now, 
what was I going to ask? Mm. Oh, yeah. no. Preston yeah. Jacobs has this maybe, oh, Connie says Eliza the Younger, Ella. Yeah, yeah. Eliza was the one who likes ho riding horses, I think. And Ariane takes her later on oh, God, I can't remember on their that. travels. Yeah, I think so. In the in in the um, leaked, not the leaked, the uh, oh God, the, I have you know the pre-release chapters. chapters. Yeah, yeah, I haven't read those yeah. chapters in ages, mm. ages. Um, what I was going to ask you is, Preston Jacobs has this tinfoil theory that Oberon was deliberately making bastards mm. in, with certain types of women. Mm -hmm. Um, which I don't really know how that works, but it's an interesting idea because they are very kind of skilled and they are, do come from very different backgrounds. Um, so I don't know. But to me, it just seems like he was like creating his own personal sellsword army around him. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, interesting and that they're all girls. Yeah, I mean, from a storytelling perspective, though, it is very, and again, it compounds that, you know, the, the kind of gender politics sways a slightly different way in, in that region of Westeros. So I suppose, you know, they're great. They're, they're, I just think, they, I mean, they were represented horribly on the TV show, but I think in a literary sense, there was always lots of scope for the Sand Snakes. Um they became a bit, yeah. you know, warrior princess on the... A little bit, yeah. a little bit. So like, the reason yeah. I say that, the, it's interesting that they're all girls. Another bit of tinfoil here. Did Oberyn see Elia when she was at King's Landing? Did he visit her? Um, because it's, it's, it is out there in the fandom that perhaps he had an incestuous relationship with Elia. And it might go some way to explaining why Rhaegar kind of just gave up on those kids because they weren't his. Maybe they were Oberyn's. Maybe he was cuckolded. But I don't know if we have any evidence. That was Visit, visitor in while he was in King's Landing. While what? she was in King's Landing, sorry. So while she was married know. to Rhaegar. Um, I don't think we have any evidence of that. It just, no. it just crossed my mind there that, mm. you know. Interesting, though. Mm. Uh, it might be another reason why Doran didn't make much of an effort to try and rescue yeah. <laughs> anyway uh we'll move on to Cersei I really don't have very much on this um other than the fact that it's a very interesting introduction to her her as a character mm. and I, I kind of feel George goes out of his way to make her somewhat sympathetic because I don't know with the exception of Kat but that's very brief I don't know if we get um this uh, kind of uh, kind of insight into grief, this sudden grief, uh, and she even references Kat. She said, "Should she claw, claw her face?" Um, because this was the thing where I thought that this was like PTSD type yeah. of behavior. Yeah, I, I've actually got quite a lot on oh, this. Oh, go for it! Go for it! I think that the. Um, the, the symbolism for me in this chapter, and it, the way it's mentioned as well, it's just very poetic, is the moth that's trapped in the King's Guard lamp. And, it, and, and, and she notices it a couple of times. She can hear it flapping around in, inside, the, inside the lamp. That's Marwin shouting, sorry. Um, and I just think that is just such a beautiful description to me of Cersei that's when she's looking at that and getting really annoyed with it and thinking just die just just fly into the flame and die why don't you and I just think that everything about Cersei is she has the this impulse that almost drives her like she is the moth to the, the to the flame and so she, good, yeah. you know, that, that like that's her in this chapter. And I think that this chapter tells us quite a bit, or at least it gives us some it gives us some things to think about when it comes to Cersei's state of mind and the dream that she has about being the queen and being like effectively a good queen. And then 
she gets this vision of Tyrion just laughing at her and then all of a sudden she's being engulfed by the Iron Throne and it's hurting her, it's harming her. I, I think that this is foreshadowing the, um, well, it's definitely foreshadowing the Walk of Shame where she's looking to see her hands and her feet are cut in this dream. Again, it's a very, you know, uh, she can she can really feel it when she wakes up. She doesn't know if she's still in the dream or not. So it's a very, it was a very sort of, a uh, strong dream that she was having and you just go read through this chapter and you think there's lots of stuff here about Cersei's self-esteem is she truly evil because I was talking to Stuart the other night about Cersei and he said oh yeah I know Cersei like most people hate Cersei but she's one of my favorite characters she's one of my favorite chapters to read and I said why is that and he said oh she's just she's just interesting because she's true evil and I thought, but is she true? Is she, is she, this is, these are all the questions that I have about Cersei. Is she a construct of her, of her, of her parents? Is she just an absolute shit? And that's it. And it was in her genes. There's just, I, I mean, find her mind fascinating. I can't tell whether or not it's paranoia, whether it's, she's got this massive chip on her shoulder about her father she thinks about her father going to hell but then she immediately starts to act like him and whether or not she is being like her father and she needs to be like her father oh, yeah yeah and and um, even that thing yeah. like she need like i love that analogy you're spot on with the moth as well to a flame mm -hmm. and she needs to be in front I mean, even, even the way she's born and, and Jamie holding on to her foot as she's born, it's mm. almost like he's trying to say, no, 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 we're not ready yet. And but nobody's holding her back. Yeah. Like it's, it's a, it's a, mani a maniacal power hungry trait in her. Mm. She sees it in Tywin and she wants to be Tywin. Like that's like more than the boys. She wants to be her father. Constantly, constantly running towards something that she Absolutely. that she thinks she wants, but ultimately will be her downfall. It'll destroy her, but yeah. also yeah. she wants to be the first. Like she's yeah. raging that she's the last to know that he's dead. Mm. Absolutely furious at that. Um, and Sonny says, uh, "Oh, sorry, Connie said that." Oberon was probably too busy traveling. You're probably right. I'm just, I'm just, you know, just throwing out a bit of what Sonny says. I think this is her descent into madness. It is interesting mm. to, I, I feel like Cersei was probably broken a long time ago, but mm. it is interesting that it, 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 we see her, we don't ever see a logical Cersei, and maybe a logical Cersei never existed, but we don't see that at all and again it's this link with Tyrion as well like you mentioned it's kind of mm. he's always haunting her she's obsessed with him she's she's her mind is this furious hamster wheel of complete paranoia she sees enemies everywhere so Tyrion Stannis the Tyrells everyone everyone around her is potentially an enemy <coughs> so she, she's there's that constant fear and then she gets the other thing that triggers her is just anger anger at things like why didn't you come and tell me about this first i should have known about this and then she gets and then that immediately flips her into these this should be happening to sort sort my father out and you know make sure that he's you know he's he, that he's treated in a manner that befits his station and that kind of trip trips her into starting to bark orders at everyone this anger so there's never any i just think she's on this constant state of like high alert all it's, the time that that wears you out right yeah that's like, that's, yeah that's yeah. gonna wear you out big time but uh you're right mm. like she is always constantly looking for enemies and when you're constantly mm. looking for enemies you don't recognize the real enemies when they're there and yeah. i feel like she's surrounded by genuine enemies that she doesn't mm. recognize in fairness to her yeah. she knows virus is not up to scratch but she realizes a little bit too late probably <coughs> long enough for him to get away anyway um mm. but somebody i think is potentially an enemy is kyburn 
I think he's it's a little too convenient that as soon as she asks for a maester, they find him lurking around. Um, and it seems to me like it's too much of a coincidence to be in the right place at the right time. To be anywhere near the Tower of the Hands seems a bit too coincidental. And it's as if he has put himself in a position where he'll be of use to her. Well, in my notes, I've said Kyburn conveniently appears <laughs> just at the right time. Mm -hmm. And he ingratiates himself with Cersei in a in in quite a clever way, but in a way that I mean, he just plays her completely, and she falls for it and says, "You will suffice." Because interestingly, nobody can find Pycelle. Because now, let me ask you this: this this to me adds weight to something something telling me that Joanna is still alive and she could be a silent sister or Joanna being a silent sister. If you knew that Tywin Lannister's wife was still alive and you found out that Tywin had died, you would probably want to go and tell Joanna first Tywin's died. Um. And the very first thing he does, even before he tells Tywin's own children, is he runs off to send a raven to summon the Silent Sisters. Yeah. That's the first thing he does. That's why he's missing. That's why no one can find him. And that's why, conveniently, Kyburn slots in there. So, Like, it should be his job to tell Cersei as the maester, right? It yeah, should it should. Be his job yeah. But I think he probably feels obliged as one of Tywin's men or creatures mm. to uh oh my god tywin's just died i better I, I better somehow get a message to joanna and let her know that this has happened and then later on there's another i don't know if it's in this chapter or another chapter no it's in brienne's chapter about the silent the, the silent sisters are mentioned yes and described as being brides of the stranger right. and cold as ice, which makes me think, is that why they are silent sisters? Because they're basically, they're whites. They're like, yeah. uh, they're dead. Oh yeah, just no, which, I, you know, which would mean that Joanna could have died, but then became a silent sister, which could, yeah, it's- And, and like, like, this is why I'm, I'm looking forward to reading Feast yeah um, in more detail this time because like things that i kind of foreshadowing that i overlooked um mm. there are so many references to her shame and nakedness like mm. and her feeling naked in front of people yeah the beginning of this chapter and it's like you would never have seen this walk of shame coming <laughs> mm. all over this chapter yes like, yeah like with um damp hair you would never think Euron is mad enough to mm. put his brother at the prow of his ship, and yeah. yet mm -hmm. he kind of does, and yeah. it's foreshadowed in his first chapter too. And it, it's 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 something that I'm definitely going to be looking out for foreshadowing here. Um, is there anything else, or should we like go on to my tin foil? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's go for it. Yeah. So Kyburn, the reason I don't trust Kyburn at all is because he's very sarcastic and a little bit smart. I see the way he goes. What should I do with the other body? Mm. What should I do with the girl? And of course, wants to point out, guess, guess what Tywin was up to. Um, and this is where T Cersei starts to think about um, her grandfather, Titus, and how he had a mistress and he had, did he have a heart attack or something, climbing up the steps or something to see his mistress, was that it? Uh, yes, yeah, I think so, yeah. And Tywin yeah, came so back and found this prostitute yeah. or mistress. I mean, we assume it's a prostitute, but it may not be a prostitute. Mm. But anyway, he assumed it was a brother. So that's the, what Cersei knows. And that she, he came back and she was wearing his jewels, which is very familiar, mm. very, mm. very like Shay, to the mm. point, uh, did this woman have a child? Did this woman have a child called Shay? Oh. And, you know, we have this whole thing with Tyrion having this kind of fantasy about sleeping with Cersei, sleeping with his sister. Yeah. Maybe yeah. He was sleeping with 
uh, half sister. Aunt, um, aunt? Will it be? No. Yeah, an aunt. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Possibly. So, I don't know. It's just it just made me think of Shay. It's Shay I very is, like Shay. She's Shay is somebody. She is somebody. And she's we, not. You know, we we think if she's not a sand snake or something, she's definitely some sort of plant from Taiwan. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, I don't know. Would Taiwan put her in a position where? But then it would tie in with like um, it would mean Tywin was sleeping with his sister, which would definitely tie in with Jamie yeah. and Cersei's storyline. <laughs> <laughs> it would make them very. Oh like my him. god! I think there's potential. You know, there's there, there, there is there's potentially all sorts of like permutations of what could have happened in, in you know with like family trees and things and he's so obsessed isn't he tywin is the person who's more obsessed i think than anyone else about the the survival of the house and the family name and yes. just and put, also put, keep someone yeah. like that close as well um mm. you know it, 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 it's like you know you don't want somebody like that necessarily out in the world although it would it would seem to me that if, if such a child existed, Tywin might kill her. So maybe Tywin didn't know that that's who she mm. was. Um, and and um, she was yeah. kind of, I know, I know Tyrion kind of referred to her as being quite young, but it sounds to me like she could have been any age. Like, especially certain women can kind of look, you know, the same as they did at 18, they can look that age at 40. Do you know that kind mm. of way? Some women are just like that, so... Um, Shay is Ty Tyrion's aunt, like Danny is John's aunt. Yeah, yeah well, there's maybe. A president then. <laughs> uh, Tani says, um, maybe that's what the silent sisters are, and they can talk to the dead. Interesting, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there is, I mean, it like it, it does sound crazy that they bought Cersei up to see Tywin her father in the condition that he was in mm. i mean i don't know maybe that's the way it should have been but presumably jamie already saw the body like that so did cersei really need Just to see her father in that condition then why would like obviously pycelle is summoning a, a raven to send to the silent sisters for someone to assist in you know making tywin because he stinks and he's a mess so they yeah. want to make sure that he's in his robes and blah 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 and what have you and he looks all stately so as a reader you look at that and think well of course he's run off to, to summon the silent sisters but there's also again an argument that he's run off to the silent sisters as his very first port of call because he wants to let tywin's wife know what's just happened and that her husband's just died so yeah I do. unless he isn't so we do know that Pycelle has a nice little trick of saying he's sending one raven but he's actually sending more than one mm. we've seen that before in a Tyrion mm -hmm. chapter right or yeah. no Tyrion wanted him to send two messages and he only sent one or something like yeah, that yeah yeah there was something about so him. you know yeah. he may have sent sent more than one raven so yeah. Um, yeah, where Connie wants to know where do you send that raven if you're sending it to the Silent Sisters? Where? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's are, are they attached to the septs? I mean, sure. there and there are a lot of septers and septons mm -hmm. and religious people who have moved towards King's Landing anyway. Yeah. So yeah, you know, um. So, so at the end of, end of this chapter, we hear news that uh, Tyrion is missing. He could be in the walls. Cersei's cursing. The, uh, she almost got rid of him. And then she starts to crumble into madness in terms of uh, beginning to believe that this Valonqar prophecy must be coming true. Yes. And uh, uh, this is a, an example kind of like with Aaron as well, who's also mad, um, that she has the answer already. Like she knew at the beginning of this chapter that Tyrion was already gone, right? Mm -hmm. She knew that he was free at this stage. And 
she already has the answer to these questions but her her um her need for power or her like this lack of logic just completely dictates her actions and what she mm. says and she doesn't listen to the logical answer and to her good mm -hmm. instincts actually that she does have like me with with blunt and the kettle blacks she's already kind of going i can't trust these guys with varus yeah. i can't trust these guys so she's very good at very and immediately like Tyrion, mm. better than jamie at picking out you know who not to trust um i i just wondered in the last time we saw jamie he disowned um tywin as his father mm. the last time in his last pov in storm mm. Um, does that mean he has disowned Cersei as a result as well? Because Cersei is so much Tywin's daughter. Mm. I don't know. I mean, he's. I think he's still trying to develop his identity post losing his hand, isn't he? Um, so I think... Well, he had to. Have known I think she's his weakness, free. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he mm. had to have known setting Tyrion free and telling him about mm. Tysha would result. I still think he knew that that was going to happen. He knew. Yeah. As much yeah. as he protests later, it's like Cersei, you know, it's like mm. you already yeah. know this is a possibility, right? Yeah. Like, Varys yeah. is playing you, or you are allowed, allowing him to play you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tywin, I think, was bad for, for uh, yeah, as Connie said, he seems to be getting cooler towards her, for sure. Mm. Um, and Tywin was bad. He was a bad guy. Yeah. So, yeah. And then finally, unless you've anything else, we're on nope. to one of our favourite POVs. Oh, it's like a warm blanket and a mug of cocoa. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. A free end It's like, like, it reminds me of the Davos, Davos chapter or a Sam yeah. chapter. It's like, this is just somebody who's nice. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing dark or sinister. Now Ario was fine as hell, but we don't really get to see much of him in his chapter. But Brienne is lovely, and it's just this repetition of, of the opening line of this is, you know, uh, a girl of ten and three, blue eyes, auburn hair, and this this repetition, and it's even said here, you know, still she persists. She she keeps the, her persistence to keep her oath. Her oath keeper, my manager, is uh, is like commendable, but also uh, typical Brienne. I wish she saw the bad in the world a bit more than she does. She's starting to, I guess, but um, stop looking for people with auburn hair. I have auburn hair. I've spent a lifetime <laughs> of people coming up going, can I touch your hair? Can I take a picture of your hair for my hairdresser? But I, I, like, it's so rare, Auburn hair. And in Westeros, it must be even rarer. So stop looking, for, and especially with blue eyes, yeah. Yeah. stop looking for her like that. There yeah. has to be yeah. a better way of looking for yeah. her than yeah. asking for uh, the rarest combination. Yeah. You may as well just come out and say, have you oh, seen Sansa Stark? Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you seen a girl that's kind of of the Tullys, but has got the beautiful blue eyes of the Stark? You know what I mean? It's like, stop. It's so ridiculous. And of course, she's instantly bought up by, um, what's your man's name? Shadrick. Instantly like says, yes, listen yes. to your love. Yeah. I know who you're looking for. Yeah, I'm also looking for, and ha and he actually, it's interesting. I'd never. He's, so his his nickname is the Mad Mouse, Sir Shadrick, who she meets mm -hmm. later on in the chapter, and he, his sigil is a white mouse with red eyes. So, and that just makes me think of like ghost or weirwood. You know, the black, the, the the white with the with the red eyes um and whether or not like again that's a, a kind of an appearance of blood raven yeah. yeah um but yeah this chapter again i've just got yeah vows and oaths and you know that uh, she made a song she, the there's two things in this chapter that jump out i mean apart from all of the characters that we get to meet the surreal for the penny the penniless and um, longbow and all these kind of decent men that are on the road and all yeah, of the, yeah, the stuff yeah. that she hears about the outlaws and the broken men in the woods and it being much worse up north 
but in this chapter two big things stand out for me one is she talks about an oath as was as uh the most solemn oath is one made to the dead um and she did actually say that in the tv show yes. so i remember doing a, a podcast where we kind of pull the episode apart and that to me was really like i'm certain lady stoneheart will be here because that you know that's a massive link that line uh an oath to the, to the dead is the most solemn oath that you can take um and she's got oath keeper and you know you all that, I, I, I kind of when i think of that line i think of the pact potentially and the mm. pact made at, at, at the wall yeah old like, old like solemn you, oaths. like the dead yeah. may yeah. represent yeah. the others so that you know whatever oath that was there yeah no solemn. no oath was as solemn as the one made to the dead mm -hmm. in this sense she's talking about lady catelyn she made an oath to lady catelyn lady catelyn's now dead there's nothing more sacred or solemn as an oath to the dead we already know from the epilogue of the last chapter the last book sorry that uh we've now got lady stoneheart so which just makes me think will brienne keep her oath to lady stoneheart later on down the line is this oath to the dead really solemn mm. in which case she's going to have to fulfill this even if it means betraying jamie even if it means killing jamie even if you know this I, th I don't know, maybe it's because it was the line that was in the TV show as well. No oath is as solemn as the one made to the dead. And along comes Lady Stoneheart. And also at the very end of this chapter, when she's back in a room and she unwraps, she's in the room in the inn and she unwraps a sword and she starts thinking about, um, you know, Ned Stark's own steel. Um, and she prays to the crone and to me, the crone is, you know, a physical manifestation, representation of the crone could be Lady Stoneheart. Mm -hmm. So again, she's thinking about an oath to the dead. And then later on in the chapter, she's also praying to the crone, which to me means that as much as I love Brienne, she's one of my favourite characters. I think later on in the book series, she is going to align herself with Lady Stoneheart even if she doesn't want to, she's going to feel that she has to fulfill this. And it's going to mean something it's being so pretty, like bittersweet, I think, yeah. with Brienne. Because even throughout um, yeah. this chapter, she thinks so much of Jamie as well mm -hmm. and of the mm -hmm. bad things that he did, but how he's really trying to be good. And isn't that all you want? <laughs> mm. Isn't that all you want as a human being? Just yeah. like to recognize when somebody is trying their best to be good um, mm. and it's so heartbreaking because I think you're right I think we're going to get a way quicker payoff to that I hope we get a way quicker payoff to that mm. in wins than the released chapters suggest um, and it's going to be heartbreaking whatever she has to choose mm. and the outcomes of it I mean if Jamie has to kill Brienne to save his own life that's going to be mm -hmm. oh, I mean I can't see how they can possibly get Stoneheart and Jamie to work together but well, maybe they will um so Connie says are the silent sisters taking a survey who's keeping their oaths <laughs> dead people um <laughs> and they're watching you Jamie maybe mm. I mean uh, you mean like when Jamie later on has his kind of little vision maybe mm. um yeah, so uh, later on, I mean, it's kind of, it's ironic as well in this chapter, as I was saying, she's going around looking for Sansa. Her investigation methods aren't great. It's more yeah. like, yeah, what's the guy, Inspector Clouseau? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of those kind of methods yeah. I'm looking for. <laughs> um, and she has these random men jump out at her from time. Oh, and she's a high-born lady as well. Yeah. 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 But she finds it hard to because she has lived her life 
as like she refers to her as the freak and the beast and all this kind of thing mm-hmm. because she has lived her life in such a non-feminine way or has like resisted those kind of urges she can't empathize or put herself in a position of Sansa and figure out where she's going and then mm-hmm. she starts thinking after talking to Shadrick that oh maybe I should be looking at this from Dantas's point of view mm-hmm. and that's the line I should be going because you know she'd be able to imagine what a, a, a fat drunken knight would think rather yeah. than 13 year old girl which is kind of sad um and it's funny as well because shadrick will end up finding sansa before she does (laughs) yes yeah that's true (laughs) i think i mean i i completely agree with you but i think she also there is something about brienne's feminine side in quite a tragic way that she does do this kind of risk assessment in her own head that she knows that there's always she's always worried about the risk of rape and the chance of rape and it does you know this happened when she was traveling with Jamie she recognizes that she could she can never really sleep very well always with one eye open when it's around men so she is aware of her you know that she is considered the like the gen you know the gentler sex even though everyone keeps saying to us, sir, so, oh, sorry, sir, no, you're what, you're a woman? And, you know, so there's this, um, there and is this vulnerability to... about Brienne, I think. Yeah, and yeah. she chooses a mare to ride as well. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of a dangerous thing to do in some ways because mm-hmm. she even marks, marks on the stallion in the stable, you know, and mm. maybe it'll sense, it might sense that the mare's in heat and that could be her as well. Do you think there's mm. any foreshadowing for, this just crossed my mind, but do you think there's any foreshadowing here for Brienne to become a silent sister with this solemn vow to the dead and this yeah, kind possibly. of yeah. session with her maidenhood and mm. um, maybe kind of garbing herself. Also, there's like lots of references then. We have an encounter with the sparrows here as well. Yes, yeah, on the way to King's Landing. So. There's a septum with them that with a crystal around his neck and he's, there's a description of him. Is this the new high septum on his way to King's Landing? Yeah. 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 Sorry, I was reading Connie's comment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Connie said uh, he does in Winds of Winter, doesn't he? Shadrick and uh, she as she's Elaine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, fires. yeah. yeah. Um, uh yes was that the new high septon yes i think so yeah 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 so. on his way to king's landing yeah and um i mean this kind of they sound already worked up this group mm. and they already sound like i uh, had they met them you know a week a week or two later they may not have gotten out of that alive that kind of like sense of yeah. urgency and, tension. and there's a lot of noise the chanting and yeah. you know so there's there, there must be a, a bit of a sight to behold because they're growing as they, you know, so this is, where is she now? Like up by Rosby, Dusk and Dale. And by the time they get to King's Landing, there's a huge number yes. of them because they're just gathering people like the Pied, Pied Piper on his way to King's yeah. Landing. And the more um, you have, yeah. the more violence they're going to get. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I mean, who could blame them? People are worried. People are starving. Mm-hmm. Um, the men have been lost at war. I'm sure a lot of capable men have been lost at war, which have left left elderly and women and children at the mercy of whoever is around. Um, but not only that, their sets have been ransacked and septons and septas have been attacked and killed. Mm-hmm. So, um, and Brienne knows this and it's, it's like, at this stage, it might be safer to go north. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah. And they're already like they're already branding themselves with the seven pointed star, and they're so there's this. I mean, from Cersei's point again, Moth and the Flame. There's this massive, massive threat coming her way, like gathering steam as it's as it's arriving in King's Landing, and and let's not within forget. a very short space of time, she just weaponizes them yeah. like that. Yeah. And let's not forget that Littlefinger was kind of keeping a lid on immigration or on mm-hmm. migration into King's Landing. He's mm-hmm. not there anymore. And 
it doesn't sound like there's anyone around capable of doing that. No. Um, so, yeah, it could go anyway now. But um, that's all I have for Brienne, unless you have any more. Um, no, that was it. I mean, apart from, again, the common folk gossiping about how the Kingslayer's hand was chewed off by a dire wolf. Yeah. Um, just some of the, the things that the stories that go around. And it's like, yeah, you can imagine that that, you know, it's, it's a bit like crap that you read on the internet or it's like, you know, fake news. Yeah. <laughs> but Brienne corrects them all and says, no, it was a, a you know, a cohoric cell sword that, Which that doesn't chopped his sound hand as off. good. Doesn't sound as exciting. Um, but then that leads her to, you know, she starts to feel sorry for him. So I think, again, the fact that she has the oath and the vow, the crone and the solemn oath to the dead, and she also feels sorry for Jamie in this chapter. Also, I also, think that sets up that that sets up a lot of foreshadowing. It also between it kind of comes full circle with the um, with the the prophet chapter, um, yeah. The story of Yuri, a young healthy boy that lost mm. a few fingers and ended up lose potentially losing his arm and then losing his life. Yeah. And yet, Kyburn was able to bring Jamie back mm. from you know potentially a very bad infection i mean he was in prison yeah. for a long time yeah. in river run mm -hmm. before so he his immune system would have been depleted but as brienne says he was very weakened but he was still a good fighter but mm. the fact that he's able to survive that thanks to kyburn and kyburn takes like makes sure that cersei knows that instantly yeah, yeah. like this is what i can do in a world where this isn't really possible yeah, you know, in a world yeah. with a lot of quacks, I'm yeah. a good, you know. Yeah, you, you yeah, yeah. Me. So, oh, he totally ingratiates himself with her. Mm -hmm. So you know, right from the beginning, and at a very vulnerable time for Cersei, in swoops Kyburn. So he's got there's a massive agenda there for him. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's he, lots of theories about who who he could be, but um, yeah, I I definitely yeah. think there's something. I mean, uh, I think Preston has. Uh, a theory that he is working with the Dornish. Mm. Yeah, possibly. Of links yeah. There. Mm. Um, Connie continues with your symbolism of the moth and says she <laughs> flies right into the sparrows. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, that's Brienne one, and that's our discussion for this week. Next mm -hmm. week, we will um, be looking at Sam one to Brienne two. I think the first three weeks end in a Brienne chapter yes very even um <laughs> so i'm i might be doing a stream during the week with somebody i'm not entirely sure yet but i might do a q a during the week as well and i'll try and figure out a better way of promoting the channel if you have any ideas of where i should be um let me know at mrs cronall um at gmail.com the link is in the description to my email, I think. It is. If it's not, it's there. And just quick promo for my podcast with my husband. If you want to check that out, link's in the description. And, of course, Claire is linked in the description <laughs> as well. So, um, yeah, you can find everything you need. You'll also find, very importantly, the schedule and all the play playlists for our previous mm -hmm. rereads, which are over on my other channel, but I do have playlists on this channel so you can easily um, follow them. You don't have to be subscribed to my nails or anything like that. Thank you so much to our very old, reliable viewers and contributors for coming along. Connie and Sonny and Ion and Boba and Johnny and Barbara. And I'm probably going to forget somebody, so I probably shouldn't have started that. Thank you so much to everybody. And as always, you can watch the chat live. If you just click it down, there's a menu. You can click it on your phone or your wherever you're watching it, and you'll be able to follow along with the chat as you listen to this live. Thank you so much, Claire. Nice You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to next week. Yes. So we'll see you next week. Thanks, folks. Bye.